Hello and welcome to the York Festival of Ideas and to this event, The Mysteries of Cinema. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, wherever you are in the world. And I think quite a few of you are joining us uh, quite somewhere away from York. You're very welcome. And I hope you'll enjoy the next 60 minutes. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Colin Philpott. I'm the host of this event. Uh, I'm a member of the university's court. That's the university's advisory body. Uh, an author, former director of the National Media Museum in Bradford, and before that, a BBC programme maker. Now, hundreds of thousands of books have been written about film and cinema. Many are, of course, about the stars of the big screen, whether in front of the camera or behind the camera. Many others are about the techniques of filmmaking. But uh, this book, uh, the subject of our discussion today, The Mysteries of Cinema, doesn't really fall into either of those categories. It's about the impact of cinema throughout its existence on society and on how we humans um, view ourselves and our world. It's written by Peter Conrad, who I'm delighted to welcome to the festival. Peter taught English literature at Oxford for over 40 years. Um, he's a regular contributor to The Observer. He's written more than 20 books, uh, many of them about film. Peter, welcome to the York Festival of Ideas. Thank you. Um, just before we start our conversation, um, uh, let me explain uh, to people who are, uh, are with us um, how uh, you can get involved. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button, um, which you will find on the bottom of your, um, uh, your Zoom screen there. Uh, it's available throughout the event, so please fire your questions in. I can see that people are already doing that, in fact, which is great. And I will do my best to pick some of them out and, and uh, push them in Peter's direction. Um, if you have any technical issues during the event, just please um, don't give up. Um, log back in again using uh, the Zoom link that you have and hopefully you can rejoin us. Um, please remember that this event is being recorded, uh, so you will be able to um, watch it again and uh, I'll explain how uh, at the end. And there are subtitles available if you want to use those to turn them on or off. If you go to the CC live transcript button, which is also there at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, that's the way uh, to do that. Uh, and let's, um, let's make a start. Peter, um, it's a fascinating book and you cover an enormous amount of ground. Let, we'll try and at least scratch the surface of it in the next 55 minutes or so. But um, going right back to the beginning of cinema, tell us, if you would please, about the early reactions to cinema when it you know, first burst onto the scene, as it were, in the 19th century. Well, it, it really burst like a, a kind of cosmic advent in a, in a way. I mean, uh, as if it were, were the answer to the prayers of the human race for a whole millennia. Uh, the, I mean, what I discovered when I started reading around about this was that the first reactions were really quite utopian. I mean, it's as if suddenly art had found a way to equal life or to represent 
life. I mean, suddenly a way had been found to make images move. And for those who saw these films for the first time, I mean, the result was, the, the reaction was absolute stupefaction. I mean, uh, a New York journalist sent a, a report back from Paris after seeing the first Lumiere films in the back room of a cafe in 1895, saying, now death has been abolished. We'll be able to see our loved ones moving around forever. We will never have to, to leave them. I mean, there were others who uh, thought, I mean, D.W. Griffith, for instance, the great silent director, said to his star Lillian Gish, we have toppled the Tower of Babel, or we've gone beyond the Tower of Babel, I mean, which God knocked down uh, because it was aspiring to touch the heavens and condemned human beings to stay on the earth because uh, by uh, diversifying their languages so that they could no longer speak to one another. D.W. Griffith said, you know, we've now got this way of communicating with every other country in the world, with people speaking every other language. I mean, we, we've found a, you know, a, a mode of communication that goes beyond language. There's a kind of utopian rapture, as well as a certain sort of fear uh, in these first reactions, which is, now that we take cinema for granted, uh, it's, it's extraordinary to look back at this. And how do you think the early pioneers of cinema, you know, imagined that their invention would develop, like the Lumiere brothers and others? I don't know that the Lumiere brothers had any conception that it would develop. I mean, Louis Lumiere, one of the two brothers, is on record as saying that uh, he thought the, the cinema had no future. Um, I mean, they were interested in technical matters, I think. I mean, uh, what we see now is a picture of their factory employees, the family factory in Lyon coming out uh, at the end of a shift. They were interested in um, tinkering with these things, I mean, in playing with the machines and making the machines work, and not in producing any kind of art. Uh, there's an analogy really with the, one of the great photographers of the early 20th century, Eugene Aceh, who photographed in the streets in Paris, who's now considered to be one of the great artists of the early 20th century. Uh, he classified those photographs that he took of deserted streets and shop windows just as documents for artists. He didn't consider himself an artist himself. So when we look at this little film, I mean, from which this is uh, one still, the film which lasts about a minute and a half, um, you know, what we are seeing is probably not what the Lumieres intended us to see at all. Um, you know, they what, had no what, idea, in a sense, what it was they were giving birth to. <laughs> I think they, they did have no idea, no. Uh, and that is kind of a sort of wonderful thing about it, that in a way the, the, the responsibility for making the thing a work of art is passed on to us. And I think now we see this in a much more rich way than anyone would have done. I mean, in 1895, when these things were shown in the back room of the cafe in Paris, people would simply have been staggered that it was technically possible and wondered how it was done. I mean, what our reaction now is, is very different, I think. I mean, we wonder who all these people are. Uh, it's a document of social history here, all these people who are dressed in such a sort of bourgeois way, except that they've been working in a factory. They all look so happy. The man is riding a bicycle behind him. You can see a carriage with a couple of horses yoked to it, which is about to to appear. And then finally, at the end of the film, after um, a minute and a half or so, we have a dog which comes out and frisks around in the street. You think, where, where has that dog come from? What is that dog doing in the factory? I mean, it's, it's, it's we who make the narrative. It's we who make the, the work of art. That's and good. the thing has this great pathos as well, because these are all living people who, uh, are no longer living. I was just thinking about the early days of still photography and indeed later on the early days of television. In a sense, it was similar. It was the, 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 the marvel was about how it was able to be done rather than what the content yes. was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the pioneers, and this is true of Edison as well in, in the United States, uh, who was working on the same invention in parallel, more or less, at the, at the same time. Um, for them, I think the, the technology, the engineering was the, the whole point. Uh, and really the way the, the medium developed in the early years when it became so fantastical and magical, 
you had uh, filmmakers like uh, Méliès, who was a, a conjurer, who did kind of conjuring tricks in a little theater in Paris and then took to filming them and eventually filmed trips to the moon and fantastical journeys like this. I mean, the whole world of fantasy that very soon opened up in the cinema so that it was showing us things that couldn't possibly happen, things that we could, we, we are dared to believe that we are actually watching. I mean, this went far beyond anything that the Lumieres or Edison could have conceived of. You talk about cinema in its early days being about uh, empathy and feelings rather than logic and intellect. Just expand on what you mean by that. Well, logic is something that, that needs language, doesn't it? I mean, you know, logos in the Bible, which means, is, which is the, the creative principle. I mean, it's the, it's the word. Uh, and cinema was, was created not by language, but by light light in combination with machinery. Uh, so what it was selling was a kind of physical excitement. I mean, the, the excitement was the excitement of watching these people walk and move in the sun, watching the man ride the bicycle, watching the man drive the carriage, the carriage which comes out in a minute, uh, watching the dog frisk around. Uh, so it, it was all about, I mean, cinema after all comes from the word for kinesis, for movement. Uh, and it was about the excitement of movement. Also, um, you mentioned empathy. I mean, also about looking at human beings, looking at them more closely than we'd ever seen them before when D.W. Griffiths began to use close-ups so that uh, we were being invited to empathize, to commune with characters like uh, Charlie Chaplin's Tramp, who soon became the most important, the most, the most famous person all around the world. Uh, this, this image now is another shot from a Lumiere film of a train arriving at the station, which I can't pronounce, I think it's La Ciotat or something like that, little rural town near Marseille in the south of France. I mean, and this is typical of the sort of excitement that these images produced. I mean, people were, were terrorized by this little film. I mean, they were convinced, it's said, that the train was gonna keep on moving and crash off the screen and, and trample them. I mean, when you see the film now, I mean, it's an amazingly tame little thing. Uh, the train just slides very gently to a stop. People get out, other people get in, um, people mill around on the, on the platform. I mean, it's a, it's a picture of a very human chaos, which once again was a complete artistic novelty because anyone painting this scene, I mean, an impressionist painter, making a picture of a scene like this, like Monet at the Gare Saint-Lazare, would have organized it and aestheticized it and disciplined it. But what you're watching here is the, the randomness, the entropy of life itself. And I mean, you talk about film's power to disorientate. Um, you know, it, I suppose fundamentally, you could say film has always been a bit of a disruptive medium. Yes, I, I believe that to be true. I mean, and this, anarchy that you see on the platform is part of that and the movement of the machine towards us is part of that I mean one of the the early French filmmakers Germaine Dulac who's a, a surrealist filmmaker wrote a, a very interesting account of this little film in which uh, she conveyed some of the the fear that the image um, produced in some people where she said that this represents the brutality of modern machinery moving towards us to crush us. Uh, but I mean, the, the whole way that films are, are put together is, is disorienting and disruptive, isn't it? I mean, uh, you're watching something that is not continuous, that is edited and montaged so that you're watching something that has been, you're watching a world which has been atomized and fragmented and then put together in another order uh, and which you have to sort of negotiate and, and think out for yourself. You're watching a kind of attack on our notion of time and space, or you're watching a sort of fusion of time and space, which is what the relativity theory was all about. This image is a very good example of that. I mean, this is Harold Lloyd, one of the great silent comedians on a dare in order to win a prize, climbing up the front of a department store, up the outside 
of a department store building in downtown Los Angeles. He's, to disappoint you, he's not quite so much in peril as he appears to be because there was actually the, the roof of another building just a few feet under, under his feet, which appear to be hanging in midair. But this is typical of, the, of what I was what I was saying before about the, the physiological excitement of film. This is what these films were trying to do. They were trying to, to make us empathize with Lloyd and to make us feel his terror as he hangs there in space, coping with the fragility of time or with the, the, um, the destructibility of this, of this clock. I mean, he climbs up, grabs the, the clock, the face of the clock, comes off so that he's suspended in space again. He tries to tra grapple around behind the clock and then gets uh, electrocuted in, in part by the, the wires. Then some pigeons come down from the roof and start uh, roosting on, on his head. I mean, the whole experience of early cinema for people who are sitting in the dark was to be frightened out of their skins by something like this, which they all would also have been laughing at. So it's producing a you know, I mean, a, a physical reaction of a very intense kind, which combines terror with pleasure. And the pleasure is very strange because, you know, I mean, are we laughing because we're glad not to be Harold Lloyd? Or are we laughing because we're enjoying his distress? Yeah. I mean, and these, these early actors, um, you know, they, they were not faking. I mean, Harold Lloyd uh, lost a thumb and one of his fingers. I think, in an explosion when one of his stunts went wrong. Uh, Buster Keaton at one point um, did a stunt with a water tower, uh, which uh, poured water into a, a train at a station. I mean, he was hanging onto the water tower. He pulled the, start, the spout of the water tower to lever himself back to the ground. All of the water in the tower uh, fell on top of him and he actually broke his neck but continued with the stunt and didn't realize that he'd broken his neck for some months. So, so you know, in a way they weren't faking it, these people. I mean, they were suffering through these physical perils, um, like the poor heroine in Perils of Pauline, that, uh, that silent film, and making us share this very intense excitement. And I suppose it's difficult for us, because we're so used to it now, to imagine what the audience must have felt and how, how different that must have been for them because it would, there wouldn't have been an experience like this for people would there, before they came and sat in the cinema and watched something like that. No and uh, although I say it was a, a an experience of intense physiological excitement and a kind of shared hysteria almost I mean which you can imagine in those early cinemas when people went to see Chaplin or Harold Lloyd or, or Buster Keaton uh, it was also a sort of spooky experience because if you think about it, you know, what you're looking at is a ghost story. I mean, I, I remember myself um, in very early naive days going to the movies in the 1950s, early 1960s in Australia, having, having a real shock. I mean, a real frisson when at a certain stage I realized that those actors and actresses that I was watching were not up there at all on, on the screen, that I was watching just images, ghosts. Uh, and Maxim Gorky, the, the Russian writer, saw one of those early Lumiere films. I think it was the, the one of the people exiting the factory, which looks to us so casual and relaxed and jovial. Uh, he saw it at an industrial fair in Russia, in, in Nizhny Novgorod, I think it was and wrote an essay about it, which is uh, a brilliant essay in which he says, I've been on a trip to the underworld. I went into this gray world where I saw these soundless specters moving around. I mean, you know, was this Hades that I was looking into? What was the status of these people? They appear to be alive, but they're monochrome people. They have no color. They're moving very jerkily. I mean, I'm seeing something, you know, which is metaphys metaphysically terrifying. And obviously the first number of years of cinema were silent movies, uh, and then the talkies came along. I mean, how did that change our relationship with 
cinema, pretty dramatically, of course. Well, there are those who claim Hitchcock was, was one of them, that it was all over when films began to speak in about 1929, because uh, movies have developed a way of telling stories silently, of doing without language. Uh, and now suddenly, according to Hitchcock, they could just be sort of filmed plays, um, just films of people talking. I mean, it, it's a, a very interesting moment when that happens. Uh, and it, it is in a way, you know, a bit regrettable because the silent cinema did such ingenious things to invent a way of communicating without speech. I mean, there's a, a, another Harold Lloyd film, I think it's Speedy, uh, where he plays a soda jerk who's uh, very interested in a baseball game at Yankee Stadium, which everyone else is working in the kitchen of the, of the diner, wants to know about as well. Uh, but he's the only one who can hear the radio, which is relaying the game. We can't hear the radio, of course, because it's, it's silent. But he can hear the scores that are being relayed over the radio. And he, sent, he transmits the news back to his colleagues in the kitchen by using items from the diner counter. So if there's a score of one, he holds up a pastry, which is in the shape of a finger. If there's a zero, he holds up a donut, which is an empty circle. And at one point he bites a pretzel in half to hold it up and show that there's been a score of eight. I mean, it's so, it was so clever, the, the ways in, in which these directors and, and uh, performers got around silence. I mean, one of the, the early films, which was partly silent, and then when sound came in, sound was added in the last reel, is a very obscure, I mean, really silly film by Cecil B. DeMille called The Godless Girl, which is about the problem of juvenile delinquence, about a wicked girl who gets sent to reformatory and crashes out with uh, another young man and the two of them you know, run away and are pursued by the cops and so on and eventually redeem themselves. But towards the end, in the reel to which sound was added belatedly, they have a little conversation about their time in the reformatory. Uh, he was in the boys' reformatory, she was in the girls' reformatory. There was kind of electrified fence between them and they communicate and get electric shocks from the fence. Uh, and they're comparing notes uh, and they're doing so with the aid of dialogue. But the, the scene had obviously been written as a silent scene so that the real communication comes from some numerals they have written on their hands, which were the numbers that were assigned to them as prisoners in the reformatory. He was 7734 and she was 3107, I think. And he shows her these numbers on the back of his hand and says, look here, if you turn these numbers upside down and he reverses his hand, they will turn from numbers into letters and they'll spell out what this experience was. And if you turn the numbers upside down, 7714, if you add a stroke here and there, spells out hell. And she says, no, no, you've got it wrong. Just look at my numbers, which are 3107. If you turn these upside down and also add another surreptitial stroke, they spell out love. And, you know, the, so when, when the cinema had, you know, kind of invented these alternatives to language, uh, language was almost a, a bit of an anticlimax. And it took a long time for the cinema, I think, to... It, it took the development of much more sophisticated microphones too, for the cinema to develop a new a new way of talking, which was very different from stagey elocution. So you have you know, Marlon Brando mumbling and and Marilyn Monroe speaking everything in a very sexy whisper and so on, producing a you know a totally new kind of speech for the movies. Um, just a reminder to. Uh... People, if you're watching this live, you can ask a question using the Q&A facility. And somebody who's done that is Ginny, who asks uh, Peter, what part do you think that the pianist, organist and music play added to silent films? Because we do associate that, don't we? The music. Brilliant question. I mean, that was the music was absolutely essential. That silent film could do without language. And it really had no need of language, as I was just saying, because it invented all of these alternatives to language, uh, but it couldn't do without the music. And the music was important because it's the music which is directing 
the emotions of the audience. I mean, music has this tremendous irrational power to merge us with one another and to um, dictate our emotions. And some, you know, some great modern composers got involved in, in this new kind of composition. Shostakovich, the great Russian symphonist, worked for a time as a, as a cinema pianist in St. Petersburg and then and didn't take the job at all seriously and didn't even look at the, at the screen, but just free associated. Uh, but then later on wrote some fantastic uh, symphonic scores for two films of Shakespeare plays, which were directed by Grigory Kozintsev, films of Hamlet and King Lear. And, uh, you know, in a way the music was, was was sufficient to itself. I mean, the, the music didn't need an image in a way. There's one of the, the early musical compositions that interests me very much is something that Schoenberg, the Viennese composer, uh, produced, which was called Accompaniment to a Cinematographic Scene. It's eight minutes of very tense, suspenseful, scary, and eventually cataclysmic music, which for which we have to imagine the accompanying movie because there was no movie. I mean, he was just composing the soundtrack for a film that didn't exist. So, you know, it's music is absolutely crucial. I mean, I'm a bit of a Freddy cat with certain kinds of films, especially if I'm watching them on my television set alone in my house. I mean, horror films and things like this. And I find that if I, if I get slightly creeped out, all I need to do is to mute the sound and I'm all right. It's the, it's the music which is frightening me, not the images. Which leads on to something I found particularly fascinating about the book, which is your discussion about the relationship between cinema and other art forms, painting, sculpture, particularly literature. I mean, I suppose now we do see cinema and film as an art form in its own right, but is, that hasn't always been the case, has it really? Well, one of the, the great utopian things that people said about it uh, when it all started was that this was, this was the universal work of art, the combined work of art. I mean, Wagner thought that opera was, especially his own operas, and he called his operas a Gesamtkunstwerk, a, I mean, a, compa a compound work of art, uh, which he wrote the music, he wrote the, the text, he designed the theater, he designed the scenery and, and so on. Well, cinema went well beyond this. Uh, and it's wonderful to see these early films, I mean, kind of showing off their own power, um, you know, showing, making paintings move, for instance. I mean, there's a, a film of about Rembrandt with Charles Lawton made by Corder, I think in the 1930s, where you see Rembrandt painting the night watch, this great picture uh, in Amsterdam of this uh, troop of guards who patrol Amsterdam after dark. And, and you see not just the still picture framed on the wall, but you see the, the burghers of Amsterdam who've been cast in the, in the roles. You know, I mean, you see life being turned into art and you realize that uh, the, the still image, uh, even if it's uh, something painted by Rembrandt, can't represent the, the totality of life, the vitality of art, the vitality of life. This image, uh, I, I mean, I wish we could make this move because this is the end of a, of a sort of eight minute sequence from an MGM musical called The Great Ziegfeld made in about 1938, I think. This, this uh, you know, really shows off the way in which film boasted of its power to combine the arts of space and the arts of time, to combine music, which exists in time, with architecture, which exists in space. I mean, it's a, it's a, a thing in which music to, makes architecture move, more or less. I mean, this is a, a white column, an art deco column, which you're looking at the top of it, which is actually about five or six stories tall. At the bottom of it, you have a tenor called Dennis Morgan, who's singing a song called A Pretty Girl Is Like a Melody. And as he starts to sing, this column, this enormous white column in a great black cavernous soundstage begins to move. 
And as it moves, you see that there's a staircase around the outside of it. And on that staircase, you have the whole history of music unraveling. Oh, not unraveling. I mean, you have the whole history of music developing. So you have time developing through space. I mean, on one of the ledgers, you see Rococo figures um, dancing a minuet. Then a little further up, you have 19th century Viennese courtiers dancing a waltz. Then you have Madame Butterfly uh, in Puccini's opera singing an aria uh, further up. And this is more or less where, where we are now in this image. You have no less than 12 people playing grand pianos, beating out Gershwin's Rhapsody in blue. And then finally, as you get to the top of the, of the column, you have this woman who is the pretty girl, who is like a melody, sitting there getting ready to float off into the infinity of space. I mean, it's, a, it's one of my favorite sequences in any musical. I mean, it's, it's perfectly silly and yet, you know, kind of astonishing and transcendent. And when you get to, the, to the, the climax of the whole thing after about eight minutes, as I've said, uh, a great curtain suddenly appears and envelops this column and all of it disappears. I mean, you've been given this extraordinary image which has actually been built. I mean, what it took to build this column and to populate it with these hundreds of people and to make it dramatize the entire history of music. It's a mind boggling. Uh, and yet having produced the image and shown it to us, they then wipe it out, it goes away. Yeah. And it's yeah. interesting that in the film, the great, the great Ziegfeld, which is a sort of posthumous biography of Florence Ziegfeld, who was the great Broadway impresario, Dick Powell plays the dead Ziegfeld, who's drinking champagne in heaven, dressed in a you know, kind of dressing gown with a cravat and so on, looking very much like a man about town, even though he's, he's dead. I mean, he's looking down from heaven at, at this spectacle, which indeed has something quite supernatural about it. Mm. <laughs> um, you devote quite a bit of time in the book to discussing the cinema as a place, as a location. Um, and uh, the almost sort of quasi-religious character of a temple where people have a sort of spiritual experience. Is that, is that how you see the cinema? Well, that's, that's, what, that's one of the things that people were expecting in, in those days. I mean, there's one, of the, one of the great modernist uh, German novelists, Joseph Roth, uh, wrote a description of going to a film in Berlin at the Ufa Palast. I mean, these early cinemas were all called, you know, the Alhambra or the Palace or, or whatever. I mean, they had very grandiose ideas about what kind of architectural model was appropriate. Uh, very often, the architecture was cathedral-like. Um, you can and you can still see this if you go into a place like Radio City Music Hall in New York or Grauman's Chinese Theatre on Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles. Wait, anyway, I wrote. Um, didn't describe the film that he saw. I have no idea what it was, but uh, described with great excitement and mystification, the whole experience of the lights going down and the curtains parting and the glow on the, on the screen. Uh, and there's something of that sense of mystery and excitement in the film, which this is a, an, a, a still from. This is, Cinema Paradiso, directed by Giuseppe Tornatore, and the little boy who grows up to be a film director and probably grows up to be Tornatore himself, is helping out in the projection booth at a village cinema in a um, little town in, in Sicily. And this cinema is for him, I mean, completely paradisial. I mean, it, it's a place where he he sees the world, he sees the world outside his little village, where he sees things that he probably shouldn't see. And the local priest forces the projectionist to cut out all of the kisses, even the chaste ones, from the movies that he shows. But the projectionist, who's a bit of a dirty old man, 
uh, glues all of these forbidden clips together in a reel that consists only of smooches and embraces and kisses. And, and so the little boy is privy to a world of adult sensuality that he won't encounter for a very long time. And it, it, so it really is a paradisial place for him, the cinema. Whether it's, it's entirely spiritual or not, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, what you see is that all of life and death are down there in the audience. I mean, at one time or another, Tornatore shows adolescent boys masturbating in the back row as they look at the screen. Then the boys a few years later have got girlfriends and they're making out in the back of the cinema. Then a few years later, one of the women has labor pains and is delivered in the foyer of the cinema of her baby. Then a bit later on, uh, a late middle-aged portly man gets overexcited watching a gangster movie when the American gangsters aim the gunfire of their machine guns out at the audience and dies of a heart attack in, the, in, in his seat. I mean, all of, all of life is in there. And at one point, the projectionist in Cinema Paradisa does a, a wonderful thing, which is to, and I think it's at this very moment that this happens, he maneuvers the projector around so that it's not sending the beam of light down through the darkness onto the screen. He sends the beam of light out into the nocturnal piazza of the village outside. And all of these great colored dreams project themselves onto the buildings all around so that the, the people who are there in the piazza wandering around are suddenly in a movie. I loved your description of the articulate gloom of the cinema, uh, and you put it, creating a sense of fear and desire. And yeah, I was it, thinking about this the, the other day about the, the darkness. I mean, that, that darkness, which is in itself spooky and sensual. I mean, it's something that we take for granted. And yet to be in a dark room like that with a lot of strangers, I mean, it was a, it was a new experience for people at the end of the 19th century. Edison's company in the puritanical United States, when they started delivering his short, they started distributing his short films, sent out a memo to the theater audiences, to the theater uh, owners, pardon me, saying there would be a good idea if they installed ambient lighting because if, if, if the room was too dark, who knows what people would get up to. And one of the surrealists in Paris, I think it was Robert Denot, uh, said, had a great slogan for this in which he delighted in the fact that uh, cinema was happening in a kind of subliminal gloom. Bravo for dark rooms, he said. Uh, and this, this film, I mean, this still we're looking at now, is from Carl Theodor Dreyer's film Vampire. Uh, and it's a good, a good demonstration, I think, of, uh, of, of what I mean by this spirituality. This young man who's just kind of been wandering through the landscape on a fishing trip uh, wanders into a world of spooks and vampires, is overtaken by them and finishes up in a coffin looking at his own funeral. Uh, so he's really having this experience of being taken by film to, uh, to an underworld, the world that uh, Gorky was talking about in that essay on the, the Lumiere film. And uh, he's looking, of course, at a superimposed image of himself. And here is another example of the way in which cinema was able to use a technical trick to convince us that we were looking at something spectral and supernatural. That, um, that superimposed image is his encounter with, uh, with the spirit that's left his body. And the coffin that he's lying in uh, is given a little sort of glass window uh, and he's carried through the streets still looking out with open eyes at the world that he has quit. I mean, it's in a way, it's another little allegory about the experience that we're having in looking at films. I mean, I'm fascinated by all of these early horror films, by uh, Vampire or Nosferatu, Mornar's film about a vampire or uh, Frankenstein, because, uh, you know, the world that they're taking us into, this world of, this world beyond life, 
or this world where, as in Frankenstein, you can dig up a corpse or a whole series of corpses and um, meld them together surgically and then animate them with electricity. I mean, these are all fables about the way in which cinema was either looking beyond life into a ghostly, invisible world that it makes visible, or else artificially resurrecting the dead in a way that that New York journalist got very excited by that I mentioned before. Another of my favorite quotes from your book was, cinema can see better than our eyes. Really? Well, better than mine, certainly. I mean, I, yours, yours are, are probably sharper. This is, this is the horrific. Uh, this, is, uh, the, this is the beginning of Bunuel's Andalusian dog, uh, in which Bunuel himself gets hold of a straight razor, gets a female accomplice whom he grips, and then as a cloud in exactly the black shape of the razor passes through the moon, in a shot of the sky and bisects the moon. He does exactly the same with the razor and slits the eye of the woman, which fortunately was the eye of a cow, which was already dead. But even so, I mean, it's kind of unwatchably horrific to watch these, this gluten or whatever it is. I mean, th this glutinous matter spill out of the eye. But this is a, you know, I mean, another little uh, fable about what cinema is doing. I mean, it's there are two kinds of films, I suppose. I mean, there are films that use the eye to look out at the world. And there are other films, like those of Bunuel, the surrealist, who look back into the head through the, the eye and are forcing a way into our brains, forcing, forcing themselves to spy on our dreams. Uh, so yes, I mean, uh, surely the, the camera can see things that the eye can't see. I mean, it's just think of James Stewart in Rear Window, putting the telephoto lens onto the camera, which enables him to, to insert himself into the quite intimate lives of those strangers who live across the courtyard. Or I think another thing that we have a, a still of is the, I mean, if an eye can have an erection, this is, this is what you're looking at here. This is the eye of Anthony Perkins in Psycho, looking through a hole in the wall uh, at Janet Lee who's undressing in the room next door at the, the motel. The way in which this eye burns with desire, the way in which the hole in the wall is making a you know, not very subtle comment about the sexual orifices. And the fact that we are actually allowed to see, we are teased with the sight of Janet Lee undressing in the, the room next door. Uh, and we actually see her, uh, she's wearing black underclothes. Um, we actually see her peeling her bra off. I mean, it's a, a terribly shocking moment for 1960 or whenever Psycho was revealed. But what makes it so teasing and wicked of Hitchcock is that she starts to peel it, but doesn't get very far, of course. So that once again, you know, we are left to imagine the rest so that you know the the voyeurism is transferred from Anthony Perkins eye into our heads. Another thing that particularly fascinates me and there's, there's so much to try and cover I'm just going to move on a little bit uh, uh, to this image because the whole role of cinema as a political tool I think is a fascinating subject. Um, this, of course, is from the Lenny Riefenstahl film, isn't it, from the Nazi era in Germany? Just from, it's the beginning of, yeah. uh, of Olympia, which was her documentation of the Olympic Games in yeah. Berlin in 1936. Uh, and the film begins, I mean, it's a, another kind of Frankensteinian moment when um, the still image moves. It begins with a display of Greek statues who are attitudinizing on their pedestals. Um, perfectly still. And then gradually they start to move and perform these athletic exercises. And in the process, they turn from Greek gods into German muscle men like this. I mean, th this topic that you raise about the political uses of imagery, I mean, it's something that really perplexes me and troubles me um, because I, I don't think I'm, 
I'm not at all sure what the responsibility of, of cinema is with these images. I mean, the Nazis obviously um, thought that film was a very important propaganda tool. But when you look at, at these images of, of Riefenstahl and then you compare them with the sort of things that Eisenstein was producing to make propaganda for the Russian Revolution, or the sorts of things that Capra, Frank Capra in the United States was producing to make uh, propaganda for the New Deal. I mean, they're very much the, the same images. I mean, the, you know, the same image of the mass, which is very important, except that the mass in Riefenstahl's films is metalized. They're all wearing helmets, whereas the, the masses in the battleship Potemkin uh, you know, I mean, much more proletarian and, uh, and not militarized. But then in American cinema as well, you have very militarized masses. I mean, you have the, the choreography of Busby Berkeley and those crazy musicals that he directed for Warner Brothers in the 1930s. Uh, you know, and then in things like uh, All's Fair in Love and War, which is from one of the Gold Diggers films, uh, you know, you have the, these chorus girls who are all dressed in in uh, helmets and military costumes, carrying bayonets and throwing firecrackers. I mean, I, I just don't know about this. I mean, I, I wish I were clearer about it in my head. I mean, I think imagery is very, very powerful um, because it makes a kind of irrational appeal uh, and any kind of political gloss can be put on it. So, I mean, you can say this is a, a fascist image um, because it was produced by a fascist filmmaker, but you know, what if this were Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible or Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator? You know, you what think, if, you know the, the politics is is very um, politics. Politics, it seems to me, is added to the image afterwards. I and mean, how effective do you think it is from a sort of political? Pardon point? me. How effective then is film as a political tool? Do you think when people try and use it in that way, whatever their politics happens to be? <clears throat> Shockingly effective. I suppose. I mean, because, uh, you know, film can, I mean, it's a, it, I mean, it always was a kind of mass medium. I mean, that, that's one of its great novelties, that it was not a medium for, you know, educated people. It was not a people, it was a medium that could be enjoyed by the illiterate. Uh, it told, uh, you know, very kind of demotic down to earth stories appealing it appealed consciously to the lowest common denominator for commercial reasons for for financial reasons so uh and it rallied a mass audience that made chaplain as i said before i mean the most famous person in the in in the world in no time at all uh and it can manage this power for good or for evil um and I suspect probably it's managed it more for evil than for, for good. I mean, there are filmmakers who've tried to use the mass nature of the medium to you know, send out a more benign message. I mean, Stanley Kramer, I remember, made a film of, of that Australian novel about the end of the world after a nuclear war on the beach. Uh, which was released in 1959, 1960, sometime like that. And he thought of it as his ministry to mankind, his, his message to mankind. And he made arrangements for it to be premiered at a time when this was not usually the case in all markets on all continents simultaneously. I mean, it was kind of the ultimate event movie kind of universal thing, but not for commercial reasons, but because he really wanted to frighten people into seeing the danger of, of nuclear weapons. But whether it, whether it changed anyone's mind or any government's mind, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I I mean, this is something that in a way I, I don't want to think about because I'm afraid of the conclusions that I might come to. And I think you know, the way imagery works on us is very powerful and, and very irrational, which is why you know, so much of, of what was utopian in people's thinking about cinema in the early days has got corrupted and commercialized uh, as images are now used to sell things. I mean, that's, that's the main use of, of the image in our culture is to get you to, to buy stuff.
Okay, um, we've a number of questions that have come in from um, our audience. Um, I'm just going to fire a couple of them at you um, quickly and, and ask you for a brief answer, if I may, uh, Peter. Sure. Gary, Gary asks, what impact did animation have on cinema audiences? Big question, I know. But... <clears throat> well, that's a, that's a good question too, because it's absolutely um, crucial and central because cinema is about animation. I mean, that's, that's what I was saying about Frankenstein. I mean, that moment in the 1930s Frankenstein when Boris Karloff twitches a bit after getting hit with the lightning bolt and Colin Clive as Frankenstein runs around screaming, it's alive, it's alive. I mean, that was the whole excitement of cinema that it could make something that was still move. And that's the excitement of, of the early Disney cartoons, I think. I mean, uh, you know, we now think of Disney as being very kind of middle brow or low brow and, you know, commercial and so on. But he was a great avant-gardist in his day. And Eisenstein, the great Soviet director, paid a visit to Disney Studio when he went to California, got photographed with Mickey Mouse and wrote wonderful essays about Disney as a kind of metaphysical biologist. He said, you know, what Disney's doing is showing us primal protoplasm on the drawing board and showing us these amoeba-like forms and the way in which they develop into, into living things. I mean, so, you know, cinema is all about animation. It's all about movement. I mean, even, even, even if we're not watching cartoons, you know, I mean, what we're watching is people moving on the screen. I mean, you know, everyone loves the way that John Wayne moves. I mean, that, that swaggering, you might not like his politics, but you've got to love the, the way he slightly swings his hips and teeters on his boots as he moves through space. So animation of one kind or another is absolutely what it's all about. Another question from somebody whose name we don't have, an anonymous attendee. Um, can you think of any modern films which have had a similar effect on the audience as the train coming through the station? We talked about oh yes, I, I can. I can think of a few. Um, I can think of the impact on myself when I saw the first Star Wars film on a very big screen uh, and saw that spaceship, uh, you know, kind of traveling apparently endlessly uh, across the screen. And then at the end of the first Star Wars film when um, Princess Leia looks out of the window of the, of the ship and sees her planet being blown up. I mean, you know, that's something that, you know, we don't wish ever to see, uh, but cinema is able to show it to us. In fact, I mean, it's a good example. We have, a, we have an image, I think, right at the end of, of Close Encounters, uh, which is a bit on further on. Yes, this, yeah. for instance, I mean, I, I will remember I, I mean, I probably shed tears in the darkness when I saw this on, on once again on an enormous screen in New York when when it first opened. And it's a picture, in a way, of a little boy who might be any one of us uh, looking at what looks like a kind of an enormous um, luminous cinema screen, which is actually the underside of a of a spaceship. I mean, you know, I mean, these were these surely were kind of transcendent moments when back in the 70s or 80s or whenever this was, uh, in the heyday of these Lucas Spielberg things, I mean, we were able to experience the same sense of wonder, the same sense of transcendence that, that people did uh, on a kind of epic scale. Uh, that, that people did when they first saw things like the train coming through the station. It's, of course, much more difficult now, but, um, but in a more modest way. Um, films of Terence Malick, for instance. I mean, there's, there's one with Brad Pitt called The Tree of Life, where Brad Pitt takes his kids out into a Texas backyard and says to them, look, wonder is all around us. And all you can see is a tent in which they're going to be spending the night because they're sleeping out and a magnolia tree which is just about to come into bloom and a tap which is dripping and a hose which is dribbling some water. But these things, you know, Terence Malick makes us look at and makes us see 
as if for the first time. I mean, transfigures them without needing to change them or to hype them up in any way. So you can have this transcendent experience on this scale, but also on a kind of more microscopic scale. Cinema can still teach us really to see the world as if for the first time. Another question we've had, I mean, to bring things right up to date is, um, somebody asks, again, I, I don't have a name for our questioner, um, with lockdown and the advent of live stream TV, do you think cinemas might become a thing of the past? Well, I reckon so, yes. I mean, and for me, kind of, they, they have been for a long time because, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's kind of, a bit grotty to go to the cinema these days. I mean, I especially hate it in the United States where you have these seats which have the, I mean, the kind of ring holders for your enormous jumbo Coke and your, your gallon of popcorn and, and so on. And the rooms are so small and, and nasty. I mean, you know, I kind of recreated the, the, the sensual and spiritual darkness in my bedroom and, and prefer to watch on a big screen at the end of the room. But isn't it? Uh, isn't so, 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 I mean, I'm not going to shed many tears if the cinemas don't, if yeah. cinema doesn't, if the theatres don't come back. It's a collective experience in some ways, though. There is something you, isn't there something you gain by watching a film with a lot of other people rather than just watching it yourself or with one or two other people? Yeah, that's, that's certainly true. So one misses that. Mm. Mm. Um, We've only a couple of minutes left, sadly, and we've only, as I said, as I feared at the beginning, scratched the surface. But let me just ask a couple of final questions, if I may, Peter. I mean, this is an impossibly la large question, I know, but overall, do you think um, if the Lumiere brothers, for example, were able to come back and see cinema and film today, what do you think they would think of how it has developed over a hundred and whatever years? Gosh, I don't know, they might have blown their brains out or, or have, you know, uh, wondered uh, why they didn't copyright their invention, probably. Uh, I think they simply wouldn't have, have understood, uh, you know, because they were, they were technocrats. They couldn't have understood the way in which uh, cinema has kind of liberated the imagination and, and undertaken this fantastic journey to show us things that we couldn't imagine seeing otherwise, like this, uh, this scene from Close Encounters. Do you think though, have we got, I mean, you talked somewhere towards the end of the book about, you know, whether we've got too much film now almost, and we start distrusting visual stimuli, stimuli because there's so much of it. Everybody has a camera, you know, in their phone. And, and Yeah, I think, I mean, what I'd probably say is we have too much video and not enough film. And, you know, people are now, as Alex says in Clockwork Orange, um, they're now videoing everything, but, you know, they, they video it in order to not to look at it. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, the proper use of a camera, whether it's a still camera or a moving camera, is to, you know, focus on something and study it and empathize with it and to think about what lies behind it, whether it's a human face or that scene in the Texas backyard that I described in Malik's film. I mean, there's something very, you know, kind of temporary and fugitive about the way in which people use the, the cameras in their, in the cameras in their phones. And there's something, as I said before, something very corrupted about uh, imagery when imagery is being used principally in our society to sell things and to sell things based on a view of the surface as well. Um, as I say, sadly, I think we must bring, bring things to a close there. We've, in a sense, only scratched the surface of the book, but I, I, I really do recommend it. It's a fascinating book um, and it really made me think about film and cinema and its place in our society in a way that you know, in many ways that I hadn't thought of before. So, Peter, thank you so much. Thank you, Colin, and thanks to everyone. Um, you know, for, for, for joining us and, 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 uh, and telling us this fascinating story so, so well. And thank you to all of you for um, joining. And for those of you who've sent questions, I've managed to get most of them in, not all of them. My apologies for those that I haven't been able to, to ask. Um, just a reminder that the recording of this event will be available on the festival's YouTube channel. If you go to the Watch Again um, part of the festival website, which is um, yorkfestivalofideas.com. Uh, it will be available there after the 20th of June when the, when the festival 
ends. Um, if you want to buy a copy of Peter's book, which I would strongly recommend, um, you can get it from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Again, details of how to do that um, are on the website. And if you go on the website, of course, there are more events coming up over the next week. Please have a look at those. And I hope you'll um, join in with some of those. So all that remains for me to do is to thank you again, to thank Peter, um, and to encourage you all to stay safe. Thank you very much. Goodbye.